everybody, this is Perch, and this is a video describing the difference between commercial art and fine art, why that matters for comics. But before we get there, I would like to have everybody, you know, hit the like and subscribe button. We are almost to 4 million subscribers, and when we hit 4 million subscribers, here's what we're going to do. We're going to do something very exciting. Basically, I don't know if you watch a lot of other live streams on other channels, but recently, Donny Cates, Ryan Stegman, his entire team, who just announced their deal with Substack, they did a live stream, and they they basically had no clothes. They were naked during their live stream. So what this channel is going to do in an act of comic charity is we're going to go to one of the other live streams uh, that where people dress up in funny costumes. We're going to steal those costumes. We're going to give them to Donny Cates and his team so they have something to wear. So that's what we can look forward to at 4 million subscribers. Smash that subscribe button. That's what's going to happen. Anyway, sorry about that. I've always wanted to do that, though. You know, I watch these other channels, and they're like, we're celebrating 4 million subscribers. When we do that, we're going to travel around the world. Anyway, uh, there, you, there you have it. Yeah. Um, commercial art versus fine art. You know, here's a story that um, I haven't told in a while, but it stuck with me, and I think you'll understand why. So back when I was in college, uh, I took some art classes because I was toying with that idea for a while. Ultimately, kind of went more down the engineering and business route, um, and the but in the art class is interesting because the class was about I would say seventy five percent what I would call fine artists versus twenty five percent commercial artists. Now, by the way, don't get too hung up on those terms because there's definitely fine artists that are commercial artists and everything else. And I, I'm not trying to pigeonhole anybody. But the difference that I'm describing here is that there were people who wanted to do the art they wanted to do, and they didn't really care about or understand or have any real plan for where to sell it. And then there's about 25% of the class, and I was definitely one of these, which is probably why I went more into business uh, ultimately, that were more interested in learning how to tune their art talents to the market. And uh, where, where this really came to a head, and, and there are a lot of teachers, and most instructors, by the way, would consistently uh, rail against commercial art. Don't let the market tell you what uh, what kind of art you should make. Don't, uh, you know, you shouldn't pay attention to that. Develop your style. It doesn't matter what's popular at the time. In fact, do the opposite of what's popular. That's what makes you a true artist. That was the kind of advice that a lot of instructors were giving, and I always thought it was terrible because I'm watching, I'm looking around, all these students are accumulating massive amounts of student debt, and they're all talking about how they'd like to go to Bali or, you know, Belize or places like that for vacation. And I'm thinking, you're not going to be able to afford any of this on the track that you're on. But uh, at one point, we got this one instructor who was teaching uh, this commercial art course. And specifically, he was spending at least half the time talking about how to recognize trends, how to understand kind of where the market was going, how to basically catch these, uh, you know, how to do advertising, how to do graphic design that was going to you know, land you a job. And there was this one student uh, who'd been with me in a couple classes, and his specialty was, and I'm not making this up, he could uh, draw and airbrush amazing dildos. And yes, you heard that correctly. That was what he did. So his specialty was he would draw dildos with uh, human expressions and sometimes arms and legs, and he'd basically make characters out of them. And anytime we were given any kind of project, he would put dildos into the project. It'd like if it was an advertising project, like, hey, you need to buy some insurance. He'd like there would be some cartoon dildos there saying, you know, don't get poked where you don't want to, buy insurance. And it was kind of funny, and the people in the class would laugh, and he was, you know, it, it, everything was, it was all very cute. But this instructor, um, I remember he, we were doing course review, um, and he would put up, he put up the guy with the dildos uh, up on the little board there, and he's like, this is very well drawn. And it was. This guy, he, he knew how to draw a dildo. He, he just, the shape was good. The uh, expressions were good. It was like if you infused really good manga uh, expressions and art and you put on a dildo. That's what he was great at. And like the, the shading and the little gleam at the end and the whole thing. Even sometimes he had the, it was more of a vibrator and a dildo. He'd have them moving around and even like you do a little fuzz effect around the side to make it look like it was in motion. And it was just great. And the teacher's like, this is really good. He's like, but nobody is going to ever buy this. And the class kind of got quiet. And the, the guy got kind of, you know, grumpy face. And it's like, look, this is a nice, you know, this is a good dildo. 
Um, but, and in this particular course review art, uh, it was a, a, you know, a, a, a little study on selling shoes. So he had like the dildos riding around in shoes and a guy, and the teacher goes, and this is the line I remember forever. Dildos don't sell shoes. And the class laughed and then it quieted down. He's like, you you like dildos. You like drawing dildos. He goes, I don't even know why, but that's fine. It's your business. He goes, but if you want to get a job at like Nike or Reebok or one of these companies or an advertising firm like Cole and Weber or uh, these kinds of groups, then you're going to need to, uh, Livingston was the, was the firm at the time that they were going to go pitch. He goes, uh, you can't have uh, dildos in shoes. Dildos can't sell shoes. And the guy goes, well, maybe the, because the student's like defiant. He's like, uh, well, maybe they'd sell shoes if they tried. And the teacher's like, no, they're never going to sell. They're, they're, they're never going to put dildos with shoes. That's not going to happen. It's not, you know, that's a, you're not going to get the job. And the guy's like, well, maybe I wouldn't want that job. And the teacher's like, that's your call. But, you know, you want to make money. And at some point, you're going to have to recognize when you, when, you know, when to put dildos in your picture and when not to put dildos in the picture. He goes, and most of the time, the answer is going to be no dildos. And then the you know the kind of the, the kind of settled down from there. We went into other things, but what does that have to do with anything comic book related? Well, uh, whether or not you like it, if you work for the big two or you work on a project where the goal is to make money, and sometimes that's not the goal. And by the way, I don't always think that should be the goal. I think sometimes passion projects. I know because I've got one of my own. I don't have an interest in making money off that project because I'm making money elsewhere. Now, if I had no other options, if I had no other things going on, if I wasn't doing the consulting, I'm doing other things, then I probably wouldn't be doing my passion project at all because, you know, I need to feed myself. But in comics, um, you know, most of the projects that you work on as an artist or as a writer are, in fact, commercial art, not fine art. Now, again, I know there's some people cringing there, and please don't get too hung up on the exact definition. That doesn't mean that you should uh, stamp and, and vomit out some corporate-approved, you know, cookie-cutter-looking art. Uh, you know, somebody like Bill Sienkiewicz is, uh, is an amazing artist, draws very different outside, quote-unquote, the mainstream. However, he found a market for his stuff. He got an audience for it, and his art... It is fine art, but it's also commercial art. And that's like the perfect win. You get to do this really amazing, uh, great looking art. Uh, Walt Simonson, he clearly has a style. It's a unique style. It doesn't look like a factory line Disney style. It's not like he's drawing Mickey Mouse using the same template that all the Disney artists are drawing. Uh, Walt Simonson through the 90s still drew like Walt Simonson. He didn't immediately start putting shoulder pads, belts, guns, and boobs on everything. Uh, but it's still commercial art. People, people go for buying Walt Simonson art. If you're working in comics, then by and large, you are in commercial art, meaning your art has to land somewhere, somehow. And if your art is more unique, less mainstream, it might mean you have to work harder to do it. Um, again, there's nothing wrong with drawing fine art. There's nothing wrong with drawing outside the mainstream art. However, one of two things has to happen for you. Either you have to be satisfied with making maybe less money than you'd make if you were drawing a uh, corporate uh, soulless piece of creation. And the soulless is a terrible word to use here. That's unfair in the other direction. Or you have to work double hard to get your art to be you know, mainstream. Bill Sienkiewicz had to work harder I would argue, to break into comics and get recognized and build up a portfolio and hone his craft, he had to get really good at his style. Whereas, I don't know, one of the very many Rob Liefeld clones, notice I didn't say Rob Liefeld, but some of the people who came along who basically just copied Rob's style were able to get some immediate appeal in comics and, and were able to get some work during the 90s, even though they weren't terribly great. But they were because that was commercially popular at the time, so they tapped into that, and it worked. 
Now, I would argue that nothing is a good substitute for hard work. I think Bill Sienkiewicz's career has gone much longer, much farther, and is much more strong and stable than a lot of the 90s image clone artists. However, he had to work to do it. It wasn't going to just fall in his lap. And one thing that seems really true today, as I look at people complaining and as I look at comic artists who have struggled, um, and writers as well, same thing is very much true for them, uh, you, you can't have it both ways. You can't do something completely out of the mainstream, uh, something that is uh, commercially risky that nobody's ever seen before. You can't do that and expect it to be a breakaway hit. Occasionally it is, but not always. And in many cases, people turn on you. If, if, you know, maybe you do get kind of lucky and you get some immediate traction, but it doesn't last. To be successful, comic art or writing, you at least have to understand commercial art. You have to understand whether you're there or whether you're not there, and you need to have a plan for how you're going to adapt to it. Again, it doesn't mean you have to change your style around, but it does mean you have to make the market work for you. And if you can't do that, then, you know, where, where, where do you go? Um, again, dildos don't sell shoes. Now, that doesn't mean, by the way, because there's a lot of dicks running these, these companies. <laughs> Sorry, children. Um, it doesn't mean that someday, maybe, by some weird stroke of imagination, um, you know, Nike puts out an ad with dildos riding around in shoes. And on that day, the guy who, uh, you know, this guy, this kid who, who, you know, made that his specialty, he will be able to look at all of us and laugh. But I think you have a better luck uh, simultaneously winning the lottery and getting hit by lightning. So make life easy on yourself. If you're a writer and artist, make it at least, well, make it a little easier on yourself. Again, hard work is still hard work. But understand the difference between fine art and commercial art and learn how to recognize what commercial art is and how to tap into it. It's actually not that hard. It takes observation. If you can, if you can nail that skill, observation, you'll be in pretty good shape. Let me know your thoughts below. Remember, 4 million subscribers will get those close to those poor, helpless live streamers who have to live stream naked. Thanks for listening.